thanks for coming everyone. It's a lovely Friday and you could be sitting in the park with a bottle of beer, so thank you. Um, I just wanted to explain what's going on on the screen. Um, the video is a series of four different layers of video and they're being mixed together by this uh, EEG head sensor that I'm wearing here. This white band has got um, sensors on it which pick up my brain waves. And in the top corner, you can see the dark grey are the kind of spikes and troughs of, uh, of kind of stress. So where it goes really high, I'm really stressing or moving a lot. If I do that, it should go quite flashy. There we go. And then if I go calm, if I can get calm, it should go quite kind of like a long, thin bar about a third of the way up. There we go. That's calmer. Look at that. Ah. Does that make sense to everyone? We're all happy with what we're looking at there. Um, and I quite like to leave the screen up and stuff just because I, I like to demystify technology. I think there's, there's a lot of this kind of idea that the less the audience understand, the cleverer it makes you look. And I, I don't really like that. I kind of think, you know, we're all people. So <laughs> basically here it just says port 5000. That's where the EEG, the Bluetooth data is being routed to. And then all I do is that I unpack the four bits of information coming in where it says unpack zero, 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 zero. That's the four different sensors. And then I just use one of those. So that number 700, 800 point da, 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 that's the, the, the voltage that it's given. And then I just scale that between naught and one and then that mixes the video. So like I don't want to blind you with like trying to pretend that this is all very clever mad stuff because that's that's all it is really and I think it's more fun to know that than to not know it sorry if I've ruined it for anyone <laughs> so yeah um should we uh should we start oh look I moved a lot and the video goes mad so you should be able to see a difference between when, when there's a lot of dark grey on the screen as it scrolls, the video will get more intense and then the calmer my brainwaves are, the calmer the video mix will be. Great. Could we have the sound, please?
see the building. It's still there. Still there.
something broke. <laughs>
Thank you very much for this performance. <laughs> and I have to say uh, thank you for two things, because uh, Amber uh, developed an exclusive performance version um, of her sound work, which she also developed for the My City, My Sounds application. Now during um, the, this um, uh, restructuring of the stage scenography, um, I just say one or two sentences on this application because I did not mention it yet because I just did not want to interfere um, 
with uh, the mood. So uh, My City, My Sounds is an application which we developed um, at the ZKM um, Institute for Music and Acoustics starting um, in 2014. And this is an application as part um, of which the, the users of this app can take audio recordings at location and um, give those audio, loca um, audio recordings a GPS coordinate. Then um, the person can combine those sounds and make um, so-called audio walks. So um, the concept for this My City, My Sounds um, residency was to um, have many, many different um, artistic strategies um, in combination with the My City, My Sounds application. So um, we already had some um, sound um, composers. We already had um, also some uh, people who um, made some sort of huge archive of the Jewish diaspora here in Germany. And now um, we have Amble Skews who shared something with us, which is just very intimate as far as I can say. Um, I'm not sure whether I can sit onto on yeah, your graphical score, which you just developed. I do. It's Man, it's an artwork in its own right. Okay, then... It. See, it's that bad. <laughs> <laughs> I put my glasses on so I can see you. See, they don't make headsets for people who wear glasses. Because mm -hmm. you can't put both things on at the same time. <laughs> Which basically means you did not see uh, what you were what really. you're doing. You learned it by heart, the map of Karlsruhe, <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so it's been vaguely one and a half week that you're here now. Yeah. Uh, do we need to uh, use the, re uh, the, the microphone so that you can hear us? For the recording, right? Okay. Then we use them. Sure. I can drink some water. Yeah, take, t take a rest, I think. Um, this is something which I think you transported with um, the piece you just um, presented or the performance you just presented is that um, due um, to your condi um, condition is that you experience uh, situations which are normal um, um, for people who don't have uh, disabilities mm -hmm. in a way more stressful way. So. Um, this is something which you actually transported. So how, did you, how do you feel now? Um, I, there are lots of layers. Like it, initially, I just feel quite tired and quite hot, <laughs> quite relieved and happy to have done it. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a really interesting experience, actually, because I, I overestimated what I would be able to do and what I thought I was going to do was utterly impossible given my condition and so after the first day the first day I went all the way into the city centre and, <laughs> and I got to the city centre and I thought I don't know how I'm going to get back again <laughs> so I had to completely rethink it because I wanted to go all the way to the like botanical gardens and I still haven't been to the big round bit in the middle of the city it's too far um, so I had to really rethink it and think about how actually yeah, you have to live on a much smaller scale. And actually for most people as a walking tour, this is, this is just something they would do in 10 minutes. Um, so yeah, it's, it, I've learned hugely from, from having to do this, what, what is possible for, for you know, my particular body in this particular city. It's been really interesting, yeah. And what does this mean in practice when you come to a new city? Does, um, do you need to uh, prepare um, in a completely different way in order to be able to navigate through the city? Um, how can we imagine this? Um, well, in general, I have to be incredibly organised. Everything has to be planned. I have to know exactly where I'm going to go, how long it's going to take, how I'm going to get there, how much time I'm going to spend there, how, where I'm going to park, how I'm going to get from where I park to where I go, how far that's going to be, um, whether I'm going to have help to get my chair out, whether I'm going to use my chair or use my sticks and if I use my sticks can I, um, are there places to sit down? Like everything has to be planned in order to do anything. Um, and so part of the adventure with doing this, um, the proposal was actually to have nothing planned and to just go to a new city and see what happens. And I think that's, that's been really interesting 
to just let go of that planning and, and to just go out. But of course, just doing this route once completely destroyed me. So what I thought, you know, you think you're going to go out and you go, oh yeah, I'll, I'll do the route once and, I'll, and then, you know, maybe I'll, I'll go back and I'll take some photographs and, and then, you know, I'll have lunch and then I'll go out and do it again and maybe do some video. But I mean, I did it once and then that was it for the whole day. <laughs> so you're sort of like, okay, actually trying to, in, to interface with a city without everything being logistically planned makes everything kind of 10 times harder and, and just reduces your battery immediately. It's like having all the apps open on your phone at the same time. It's like, <laughs> and I got back here and I was just like, <gasps> So actually, you know, it took so much more than I thought it would. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's really interesting to just to try to do something without everything being controlled and, and to see what happens. And what happens is, is a mess. <laughs> yeah. So at first you started to explore the city and then um, um, at which point did, uh, did you actually start to collect um, materials um, already at day one or Yeah, right from the beginning, um, just because I, it's one of those things that once you get used to a place, you stop seeing it and hearing it as an artist and you start seeing it and hearing it as a person using that space to get around. And so one of the, you know, one of the great things about being invited to a new city is that everything is new. And I think if you, if you record at that point, then you get things that you wouldn't hear three days later. Do you know what I mean? I, I think, um, <laughs> but um, what we actually um, heard, it almost um, sounded as if you were reading f um, your thoughts, f um, which you wrote down into a diary, something um, like that, or one was under the impression that you um, share with us your inner thoughts, yeah. in a way. Yeah, that, that was all um, kind of improvised, so there are two soundtracks. Um, and one, the first one I did was the one that's wider panned and it's actually, it's quite emotional and that's why it's a bit lower in the mix. Um, I did it after I did, I did the big, the big excursion into town the first time and then the next day I was really like, oh my God, I can't do this. This is, I've said I can do this and, and I physically can't do it. And so when I did this smaller route, I was, a kind of exhausted from the day before and be quite emotional and stressed and so that then when I got back from that route I immediately just talked through how I felt I sort of visualized it in my mind and recorded myself just speaking and it's all it's not edited it's just um it's just verbatim kind of improvising speech and then I went away and rested and came back and did it the next day because I thought I can't use that. It's too intimate. It's too raw. It's too vulnerable. And, it, you know, I feel slightly awkward about all of that vulnerability and, and I didn't know if it was appropriate and, and I didn't know how much of that I wanted to share. You know, as a disabled person, you kind of have to show people the best all the time. You kind of have to be brave and be strong and and to share something that's th that, is, that feels very vulnerable and, and very kind of um, weak is quite difficult when you're used to sort of trying to make the best of things, you know. So I went, I had a rest that the next day and then I think I had two days just in bed recovering and then I did it again and I recorded the other vocal and then as I was using it I realized that actually that's a really nice kind of um, it kind of shows the two sides of you you know there's the one rational side that says okay I'm in a wheelchair but it's not that bad and you know yeah it's a bumpy floor but I'll get over it and you know it doesn't matter if I can't get into this cafe I'll just go somewhere else you know it's that person that just kind of rolls with the punches and then under that was this kind of more frail um, kind of vulnerable upset voice that, that's being a little bit more kind of damaged in a way by the experience so I, I wanted to keep both of those but they're both um, They're both completely just improvised and not edited, so it's just off the top of my head, this is how I feel. I just tried to be really honest with it. This microphone's really heavy. <laughs> so then um, your, um, the recordings, um, you say now that they um, came into existence 
on location. So they were taken in situ documenting the, the, the process or did you take them um, af afterwards in the sound studio? The, the vocal recordings were in the sound studio um, just because there, there's a lot of extraneous noise outside and I wanted it to be really intimate and really quiet and I had recorded some vocal outside but actually then there was so much traffic noise that it, saw, it just didn't really work. Um, the other stuff like the dogs and the kids and the cafe and the cars and the trams and the, the sound of the wheels on different textures, that's all done outside as I was doing it. Ha oh yay, that's the solution. A machine that holds it for me. Cyborg arm. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Awesome. Yay. <laughs> Cyborg arm. <laughs> so um, when it comes to the content of the recordings you, um, you took, then um, I was under the impression that there were many different layers. Like um, there was some sort of meta layer, as I would uh, call it, in Sofa, that you actually um, you, you said something about the cyborg um, metaphor, which you brought in. Um, and I think this is some sort of different layer, right, in comparison to the layer where you actually um, document your feelings uh, when you are travel the city, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'm just really interested in th like this, this current discussion of the cyborg as something like really science fiction and really exciting. And it's almost like for the, the sort of hyper cool people that are getting into this and they're kind of rich and they're middle class and they're educated and they're arty. And then you look at like deaf people who've been wearing hearing aids for like 30 years and actually have, you know, had a lot of stigma for it. And it's like, you know, disabled people have always been cyborgs. Like, you know, from a crutch to, you know, my chair to, you know, cyborg arm. I've literally just got a machine to do a thing to, to enable my body to be in this space. And, and I'm just really interested in that idea of, of the disabled person is actually, you know, there's a bit where I say we're, we're at one with our machines. They, it, they just kind of become part of our, part of the way we move and part of the way we interface with the world is using a machine to facilitate that. Um, and I just love that idea. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Re recently, one is under the impression that this term uh, also uh, comes back, just as you just said it. Mm -hmm. Like uh, many uh, people make uh, performances with uh, with cyborg-like gear and stuff like that, <laughs> or people actually implant uh, ears where yeah. actually their arm should be, yeah. like the stellar guy. Yeah, I d I just think it's really funny because it's kind of like people who are trying to use cyborg and stuff and make a huge point about it. And meanwhile, all the disabled people are like in a cupboard going, we're already doing it. <laughs> you know, it's like, why not refocus on the people that actually do this 24 hours a day rather than able-bodied people going, oh, I'm gonna stick a weird eye on my brain. It's like, well. Or you could talk to people who've got cochlear implants and people that have had like eye surgery and I don't know, I just think like the culture of disabled people is so interesting, um, but we very rarely look at it. Um, and, and actually it's so rich and it's so kind of interesting philosophically about how we use technology and how, uh, you know, um, yeah. But then how that's kind of twisted by an able-bodied society that look at it as some kind of failure. But then when they use it, it's super exciting. <laughs> and you're like, what? Uh, yeah, I just really like it. It's really interesting philosophically, yeah. Yeah, so um, I think um, your project and also your performance uh, really raises um, awareness and sensitivity uh, towards this because um, also I, I, I tend to uh, f forget um, that um, you experience this in a completely different way because uh, you're so, just so unpretentious and just so uh, a person. You are, when you approach us, one is just not under the impression that um, there is something which um, makes a huge difference for you. Yeah, I mean, Do you mean you, like the, the disability seems invisible? I mean, I know it not. Uh, the, the audience does not know it that you uh, actually have quite a career now in the um, also in this in this business. You're, you're a, a, a performing artist. Yeah. You mean you you yeah. you work in the uh, in the domain of, of music, 
Um, so one really tends to, uh, to, to forget and uh, maybe even loses uh, the, the sensitivity mm -hmm. towards, um, yeah, towards your circumstances. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't, <laughs> there's so many layers in that. Uh, like one thing is that being ill or being disabled doesn't change who you are, it just changes the way you have to do things. Um, and so it also gives you a huge freedom. So there's this amazing woman called Ricky Buchanan who I want to give a shout out to. She also has ME and she is, I don't want to give anyone the idea that I am a typical person with ME. I am very mobile uh, for people with ME. Most people are a lot worse than I am and I'm very grateful for that. Um, not grateful that they're worse, but <laughs> grateful that, that I'm able to do what I do. But Ricky Buchanan is, is, um, is homebound most of the time. She struggles to use Skype or to type on a computer because it just wipes her out for days. But um, she was really gracious and gave me a, a Skype interview um, for a, a bit of research I was doing. And she said that being disabled gives her an amazing freedom because society doesn't have any expectations of her. It doesn't have expectations that she should get a job, that she should be successful, whatever we mean by that, that she should be a certain body size, a certain body shape, that she should be in a relationship, that she should have children by a certain age, um, or that she should, you know, be married or whatever. Um, and she was saying that with all the negativity of being disabled, it's, it's actually like you get this freedom to, to say, OK, I don't, I don't have to do any of those things. I don't have to conform. I don't have to have a nine to five job. I don't have to try and climb the career ladder. I don't like all of that has been taken away from you anyway. Um, and, you know, there's no way that I could do a job like you do and come in and work, you know, between, I don't know, eight and ten hours a day, five days a week. All of those jobs, all of those career paths are completely closed to me. But rather than look at it in that way, I look at it like, great, I can do what I like. I actually can. And if I want to spend my whole time messing around with sound and making soundscapes, I can do that. And if I want to be an artist, and, and I, I can do that. Um, and, and there is this strange sort of freedom that comes with having choice taken away, because the less choice you've got, actually, the more freedom you have to just do the one thing and, and just focus on that. Does that make sense? It makes totally sense, yeah. So. Um even though you bridge many different artistic disciplines in your own artistic practice, as as far as I can and as far as I can judge, mm. I mean you just uh, developed graphical notation in a way <laughs> 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 for us to realize what you what you basically did in the city. Yeah. Um, so, as a s basically you are a, a sound artist, mm. um, one one can say even though you incorporate many different um, mm. aspects into your own artistic practice. Mm. So now um, when it comes to the technology you used um, with the smart devices and the My City My Sounds application, um, do you see what do you see there are some potentials which you could not fulfill with other uh, media or was there something very special about this medium? <sighs> About this particular project, you mean, or, or yeah, using... Yeah, for a sound artist, the, the possibility to work um, with the idea of, uh, of a certain location and that you can share um, um, artistic work which is bound to a certain point in space. I, I, I think so. I think that there's, I guess, there's two different answers to that. One is that um, I generally don't work just in sound. Um, because I find the, um, the theory around sound and, and the kind of um, uh, the aesthetics and the way that decisions are made around sound tend to be quite limiting and quite conservative. And, and it's difficult to operate as a, a woman in that environment. And it's even more difficult to operate as a disabled woman in that environment because there is a sense of good sound and bad sound and what you should do and what you shouldn't do. And, and all of that can be quite limiting. So I took my practice into performance because within performance art there, there's been much more discussion around um, the, the freedom to explore um, 
the freedom to explore uh, aesthetics and identity and and to not be bound by by a kind of linear canon of of acceptability in the way that sound can be a bit kind of limiting and then in terms of this project um i i really felt that it it was an opportunity for me to communicate what it's like being a disabled body in space and and there's not many opportunities to have that conversation but by putting myself into a city and mapping all of what happens to that whether that's the EEG experience or the I had heartbeat monitors on one day uh, or whether that's like the way that the the the, the chair affects the the video footage or the, the way that it affects my brain and what I choose to say about it by by documenting all of that it, it's kind of like saying this is a disabled person in space and this is and 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 it exists and and in it's a, a valuable it's a valuable thing to document and it's a valuable thing to share um whereas i think just making a sound piece probably wouldn't have that same wouldn't you wouldn't be able to deliver as much context maybe so does that answer your question mm, yes and 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 uh, maybe. yeah yes and probably a little bit of no but more yes Okay. Uh, uh. So, um, <laughs> you, you know, I just did not have the chance yet to experience um, the piece at location. Yeah. So, I mean, your work is basically just not finished yet. So very soon you will yeah. probably finalize the piece of work and then I will be able to um, go out in the city and also um, make this experience um, with, the, with your audio piece um, on my own. So I don't know yet what uh, I can expect from this, but I'm very excited to, to experience it very soon. Which brings me to the very basic question, when will it be finished? Oh, well, uh, Gertz, I don't know if he's here, but he's been really helping loads. Um, so he's been uploading stuff onto the, the app for me. Um, I think he was doing it yesterday. Um, there are a few technical things that we need to sort out. We need to put some images on and there's one track that needs to be rebounced. But it's kind of within the next couple of weeks, we're hoping that it will be downloadable. Um, and hopefully as people walk this route, they'll they'll be reflecting about how they feel about the walk and then hearing how I feel about the same thing and kind of maybe getting some kind of, um, uh, yeah, just some sense of the, the invisible distance between us, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. So um, basically the parts um, which you presented today, mm -hmm. um, I mean, there were a, f a few breaks between certain parts. Yeah. So, um, and also I can see that here are no, um, different numbers. Yeah. So you s probably started with a one. Yeah. And I see the highest number, f 15? Uh, 16 is the Six, last 16? one. You get back to ZKM, it's just there okay. by the red. You can't okay. really see it very well. Uh, so w this basically means we can expect um, a 16 part audio walk, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. basically. Yeah. <laughs> And, and then I was wondering whether, you, because I'm very also interested in uh, the gear you oh, use, yeah. like, um, can you share something about those uh, this, these pieces yeah, of gear? Yeah, well, this is like um, just a commercial, it's called a Muse. It's just got like some sensors on the inside of the headband mm -hmm. there and they pick up the voltage in your brain. And so, um, Generically, the more stressed your brain is, the slightly higher the voltage, and then the calmer you are, the lower the voltage. And these are kind of mass produced for, for like, um, it's like a meditation app, and it plays little tweety bird sounds at you when you're calm. Um, and I mean, there, it's a bit, you know, it's a bit first world problems, isn't it, if you have to wear a headband to <laughs> meditate. But anyway, I'm glad they exist. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there were some guys who, who discovered that, that rather than pair them with your phone, this is one of the only ones that you can hack into your laptop. So you can pair it with the Bluetooth on your laptop and then you can go into terminal and tell it to route that Bluetooth through one of your UDPs. So I just use 5000 and then I pick that up in the Max patch and that just spews out the raw data into a Max patch for me. Um, I, I was having trouble with it the other day and um, I 
I messaged the Muse team and said, oh, I'm having trouble with it pairing on my laptop. I've got it going through terminal, but da, da, da. And they just came back and went, oh, no, it's not possible to use a Muse with a laptop. And I was like, mm, yeah, it is because I'm doing it. <laughs> and they were like, what? what? No. <laughs> so there seems to be some confusion. Um, I mean, I'm not a huge, amazing technologist at all. Like I know what I, I figure out how to do what I want to do with a lot of pain involved. Um, there are some people who could probably hack it in a couple of minutes, but it took me a long time and a lot of pain. But, it, you know, it, it's just a commercial meditation toy. So, so it's a ba basic consumer product one could yeah, yeah. probably get on the internet. Oh, some. for sure, yeah. Okay, yeah. Huh? yeah. Um, but and yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and then you hack it. <laughs> then you hack it, yeah. <laughs> and you mentioned something about heartbeat sensors. Yeah, I haven't uh, got them here. Um, yeah. again, they're like these little tiny um, things. Again, they measure, measure voltage and they're like these little tiny discs with three wires coming off them. And you can order them from China for like two cents each. And you just literally sellotape it to your finger and the wires go into an Arduino and the Arduino then puts that data into you. Ah, okay, Max. so they also um, produce, let's say, control data, which yeah. you can use in your Max patch. Yeah. Okay. So um, because at some point I was not very sure whether this is now live or whether it's pre-recorded data streams which you took um, at location. Uh -huh. I was not. I just wasn't sure. I probably you mentioned and I. I no, I didn't. Um, <laughs> so I used um, pre-recorded data streams and then mixed it in the studio because I just, I don't have the cognitive ability to manage um, a city I don't know and a wheelchair and loads of tech and a live stream all at the same time. Like, uh, it's just too much, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. I think, I think there's only uh, one guy who can control uh, his brain uh, in such a crazy manner. Elvin Lussier, do you know the yeah, piece? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, there's this piece, music for, uh, for solo performer, where he uh, yeah, basically sits and meditates and as soon as his, uh, um, how do you call it, uh, the rate of the, the, the frequency of the EEG goes down to six hertz, then um, sounds are triggered uh, in this frequency domain. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that's basically what this does on a commercial level. Um, it, it measures the frequency as you're meditating, and then as your levels go down, it starts playing little Tweety Bird sounds out of your mobile phone. <laughs> like, so yeah, it's, it's, take, it's from that end. But it, it, yeah, it's, it's very like... Um, so I'm doing my PhD at Plymouth and uh, Edmo Eduardo Miranda is their professor of Miranda and he does stuff with EEG where they have the full cap and they have, um, they're sort of managing to isolate different parts of the brain which um, vibrate differently or the, 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 the waves change when you think in a certain way and they've used that with disabled people. Um, so that they can tell which part of a screen somebody's looking at and then use that to control. So it would, it's great for people who've had stroke or um, have locked in syndrome or have really reduced mobility. Um, these things are literally like, are you stressed or not? And, and, and how stressed? So it, it's a very kind of basic tool compared to the, this kind of full EEG sensor. But we're not, in terms of EEG technology, we're not really at a point where we can say, oh, that electrode did that, so this person wants a cup of tea. You know, it's just not, the, yeah, we're not there yet. Yeah. It, but, for, you know, in terms of disabled people who have stroke and locked-in syndrome and stuff like that, it, it's potentially got options to enable them to communicate, but it also has option that it, that it has a potential for that to be exploitative as well. So we have to be really careful about. As a disabled artist, I'm, I'm in this really interesting position because in the UK, what generally seem, <sighs> this is really hard to kind of phrase properly. So what generally tends to happen is that there are people making tech and they want to make tech for disabled people. And so they talk to the disabled people, they make the tech and then they take it back to the disabled people and they go, look, we made you an amazing thing, which on the surface looks like a really lovely thing to do. 
but we we have this this kind of imbalance of power where it's able-bodied people making things for disabled people. And as far as I'm aware, I'm the only disabled artist making tech around, making their own tech around performance strategies for disabled people. And so there's this kind of power shift um, where if we flip it and we look at a different grouping, if you had a bunch of white people running an organisation that was about empowering black people, but there weren't any black people being paid, you would you would kind of look at that and go oh that's awkward right but in the disabled world that is that seems to be it's very rare that it's the disabled people doing the work for themselves getting paid and and having the power over their own projects and I think that's what I mean when I say there's there's a possibility for exploitation in that it's you can make technology to support the expression of disabled art but then it becomes a kind of grandstanding, like I am an amazing able-bodied artist and I made this great thing for disabled people to worship me, you know, and it's like, well, it's not, it's actually not about you. It's, it's a, like, how about we spend our time training up those disabled people so they can make their own solutions and you just get out of the way and do something else, you know? So there's, there's this kind of real tension that we don't really talk about where disabled people are quite often always working through the filter of able-bodied people. And we have to be careful that that filter doesn't, doesn't distort what disabled people are actually trying to do or what disabled people actually want to say. And it's not for me to say what they want to say either, just because I happen to be one of them. But, it, it, you know, I, I, I feel like, you know, for me to get onto this stage and say this is, is a step in the right direction um, rather than making things for disabled people and making a video about it and then the able-bodied people talking about it at a conference. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. This makes total sense. Good. Okay. <laughs> and I'm also pretty sure that something very interesting will come out of your research. I mean, I'm mm. a little bit uh, familiar with the work of uh, coming from your department and I'm pretty sure that your professor stood just uh, two meters in, the, uh, in that direction <laughs> a few months ago okay. when he presented something very weird with a with a grand piano and a living organism. Which oh you, yeah, yeah, the slime computer. Slime slime computer. Yeah, yeah. slime world said, computer. Something slightly weird, but very impressive. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure I really understand it. Uh, yeah, yeah, ask him. <laughs> something about slime mold grows, and as it grows, it becomes an organic neural network, which then produces voltage, which plays the piano, basically. So you're doing awesome stuff at Plymouth, one can say, and so I wish you all the, all the best luck for the PhD thesis. Thank you. Uh, so um, if you're fine with that, I would suggest that we um, yeah, um, grant the audience also Yeah, a few I'd love questions. that. If anyone wants to have a chat, uh, that would be cool. Um, so if you would like um, to raise some questions, then now it's a perfect opportunity to do so. Over there. Oh. Hi. Hi, everyone. Okay, first of all, thank you for the performance. Thank you. But I'm eager to take some more information about the ECC signal. Yes. Yeah. Uh, was it... At uh, first, I, I assumed that uh, the performance was controlled by the EG signal. It's, and you answered him that it was pre uh, prepared in advance and what was the function of the EG signal oh, the e during the performance? Uh, it was controlling the video. The video? Yeah. I've, I missed the line at the block diagram from each signal to the, to the videos. Yeah. Uh, hang on. Shall I? Hang on. I'm going to go over here. I have to turn my machine on to do that. Okay. Ooh, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. OK. Um, so if I close that window, so basically I've got, I have to come out of unpack to there because I disconnected it. So here we've, this is the port with the data coming in yeah. and then um, we route it and unpack it. And then you see there's these four spots here. One, two, three, four. Each of those is giving out um, data. Those are the four different sensors. So that's mm -hmm. sensor one, sensor two. I mean, it's just giving out nonsense now because I'm not wearing it. Um, so those are the four um, sense, the four different sensors, and that's the data that's coming off them. I'm just using one of them, 
um, and then I scale it between naught and one because the video mix works mm -hmm. between yeah. minus one. Four one. Sorry. There are four layers. Actually. Yes, yeah. there are four layers, um, and and when you use a video crossfade, it crossfades between naught and one. So naught is video A yeah, yeah. and one is video B yeah. playing. And so we want... It was not randomised for the mixing. No, that... It was controlled by the ETC. Yeah. Okay. So um, if I look inside, there's a patch here called Insides. Yeah. And these are the four videos playing. Yeah. And then here you see this is the crossfade tool. Mm -hmm. And these numbers here um, are the numbers coming off and the EEG. The sound is pre-made. Pre-made. Yeah. Completely. So that the sound is mixed with the EEG and the, the pulse sensors, but that was done in the studio oh. because it's been made for the sound walk. So that and the was color and when the color was mixed by random or by, by a signal from each scene to cut the, the picture now black and white and sometimes yeah. color. So that's um, that's done by the EEG as well. By the EEG. Yeah. So, okay, yeah. So everything on the screen was being mixed by EEG and all the sound was pre-mixed in the studio, but with sensors, but just not live. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> now it's looking like a barcode. Yeah. Well, do you want to put it on? Do you want to see what your brain looks like? Oh, I think everybody would love to see what my brain looks like. <laughs> uh, so I sh should just uh, Yeah, just put it? it on like a pair of glasses. And in, just make sure in, the sensors um, are... This direction yeah. or in that, that direction, right? No. Other? Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Like, like this? It. Yeah. And then just make sure the sensors are against your forehead making connection. Oh, you've broken it. No, you haven't. So this is your brain. Let me just check. Yeah. So that, that's what your brain looks like right now. It's that, yeah, you're just a barcode as well, I'm afraid. Wow, your brain's really jumpy. <laughs> uh, I'm just not the Elvin Lussier kind of guy, I guess. <laughs> uh. Hmm, okay. Yeah. At I first mean, I expected a red line or something like this. Just like, <laughs> 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 Okay, okay. Yeah. Are there some more questions? Huh? <laughs> okay, over there. So, um, first of all, thank you for sharing all these very intimate uh, thoughts with us. No worries. And uh, also, I'm very thankful for you to for these images of your point of view of the city. And uh, my question was uh, very simple: How long did it take? Or the whole walk? Do you mean to do the loop? Yeah. Or to make the thing? Just to, yeah, do, to do the loop? To do the loop, probably, I think for me, probably about an hour. Uh, how long was it in terms of distance? Oh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know, sorry. Okay, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're looking very cool right now with your... Yes, I, I feel very cool. Meditation. Do you feel like a cyborg yet? Um, I have to admit I'm a huge uh, Star Trek fan. Oh, so okay. You, know, Lau, you feel Lau, like I Data. Feel not Data, but uh, Jordi. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, so anyway, um, are there some more questions? I mean, this is the particular strength of this format that we now have the possibility to ask her all those questions yeah. after her quite intimate performance. You don't have to phrase it like a question. Like if you have a comment or a criticism or you just want to chat, that's also fine. So, yeah. Then I just make no. a comment. I think it's, okay. um, it's very, very interesting and intimate that you also share the whole screen. Yeah. So one was under the impression that one is uh, some so, um, in some sort of uh, your own environment. Yeah. Uh, because it's um, such a private space. The, oh. the computer, you probably yeah. switch it on every day. Yeah. Working I on it. I did tidy up my desktop before the show. <laughs> <laughs> Which makes it even more intimate. It's like I'm not showing you all the files that are on my desktop. But um, 
Yeah, I, it's that, it's kind of like a feminist perspective on technology, I think, because, um, you know, we, we've had this kind of culture of technology being like, you know, all these cool guys on, on stage with laptops and you can't see what they're doing, but they're really cool. And they could just be checking their emails and playing a track, like, and, and I like this feminist perspective of de demystifying technology. It's like, actually, it isn't that scary. You know, anyone can do it. I'm not putting myself up here and go, oh, I'm really clever because I did a thing. It's like, actually, it, it did take me ages. Uh, but actually, once you figure it out, it's like, oh, that's how you do it. And uh, I think we just, if we demystify technology, it becomes less of a kind of secret club that only certain people can access. And it's kind of like, yeah, if, like, this is how it works. If you want to see how it works, that's how it works. And I, I, I like that kind of, it's more of a feminist perspective, I think. For me, anyway. I can understand this and I tend to think that the technology gets more and more demystified and so far that probably almost all of you have some smart devices with you um, or let's say 50% of you. Um, so yeah. will they have their small mini computers? So. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. That's the irony about this, right? We're all being tracked every day. All our data is being collected. So why not show it on a screen in a room? Because like everything, if you have a smartphone, is being collected by a corporation somewhere. Uh, so. <laughs> and then, uh, as another uh, quite good thing is, uh, if they carry around their smart devices, they are able to download the application My City, My Sounds, <laughs> um, which you can find in the App Store. Uh, my city, my sound. So I think that in vaguely um, one to two months, you will be able to download um, the walk um, yeah. by Amble Skews, and you're cordially invited to um, to travel the city and to experience um, the uh, recordings she took, and um, yeah, to experience the sound walk by Amble Skews. Yeah, so. exciting, right? Emma, then um, I thank you very much. No, thank you for having me. It's been amazing. And everyone here is just so lovely. It's just been great. So thank you. And thank you. So we thank, <laughs> thanks to all of you as well. So now everybody has some thanks, uh, which she or he can take uh, home. And uh, yeah, we just hope to see you again. And I hope to see you again. And I'm pretty sure I still see you on Monday, right? No, I have to go to Rome tomorrow. Then we need to say pro uh, pro uh, goodbye properly yeah. later when, when they are gone. So, uh, <laughs> thank you very much for attending and I wish you a very good evening. Thank you for coming.